All right, so we'll talk about endoscopic TLFs, and I'll be uh, swift here, um, it's not to repeat anything, uh, but I think there's a couple of uh, details that are worth mentioning. My disclosures here, uh, so those are the objectives. I just would like to have everybody you know, roughly know what this procedure can do and what it cannot do. Uh, I would like to show you what tools you need to perform this type of surgery, understand the surgical steps, and explore the limits and the future possibilities. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that this is going to be the future MIS TLIF. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of things that are changing right now that it, it's obvious that we're going to this direction. So let's start about indication. So we talked a lot about anterior intervertebral inter body fusion, anterior column support. The nice thing about the T-lift compared to the A-lift and the O-lift and the X-lifts is that um, it allows direct visualization of the neural elements. Um, and it allows for direct and indirect decompression of the ipsilateral foramen and lateral recess. So for that reason, we typically do MIS T-lifts and endoscopic T-lifts on the ipsilateral side of the symptoms. Uh, biomechanical, it, there's an advantage of supporting the anterior column, and obviously we all want to increase the low doses. So advantages of MIS as an endoscopic T-lift, uh, it's less destabilizing. So as you have seen uh, at the very nice demonstration of Paul, uh, you have to cut the inferior to process and part of the facet joint with the, as you'll see, the endoscopic T-lift, given this small footprint, you don't have to destabilize the ipsilateral joint. Um, especially, I don't know if you practice in a place where you have very large patients um, with a tubular system. Once the tubes get longer than eight centimeters, it becomes very, very difficult. With the endoscope, you don't have that limitation that much. And if you have the limitation, you can always call for the long set. And Osama, you've been here, we ordered in the long set for this one patient, and you just get an extra couple inches, and, um, and that really helps. So very large patients, definitely uh, that goes to the endoscopic T-lift. There's less nerve uh, retraction. You saw that you know Paul was you know exposing the thecal sac, uh, the ipsilateral nerve root, a little bit of the contralateral side. Um, but you know in this case we're going to see the traversing nerve root, but uh, not retracted. Uh, again, we don't have to because we're right in the Camden's triangle. Uh, we can visualize the disc prep, so once we're done, it's not like this kind of like massive hole with smoke, uh, but it is uh, an area you can put the endoscope in there and you can look at the end plates and make sure that they have good preparation. Um, there's most likely a decreased teratomy rate. Now again, that's, that's an un undocumented claim. Uh, and again, the nice thing is if you're in a place where you have uh, supportive anesthesia, it is very feasible to do it awake. Um, and there's a faster, definitely a faster patient recovery. Disadvantage, it's yet another technique that you have to learn. The equipment has additional costs, but we actually compared endoscopic and microscopic at my place and the cost was exactly the same. Once you pay for the microscope that drapes all the disposables, it comes down to almost to the dollar, the same amount. Uh, we, uh, one difference that we do, and I'll show you in the lab afterwards, we always do a foraminotomy uh, to avoid irritation of the exiting nerve root. Uh, and so you basically try to get your cage through the medial portion of the Cambian's triangle. Um, one other disadvantage is if you have patients with central spinal stenosis, this technology is difficult to do because the transformal approach needs a transformal endoscope, which has a working angle of like 25 degrees. And so it's not the same endoscope you would use for a central decompression. Uh, and by the time you bring in another endoscope, another whole set, I mean, <clears throat> as we've discussed before, um, you know, MIS is great, but I think once you add so much complexity in order to just do this. Uh, like Timur said, I think it was his first sentence this morning, yeah, and then you do a discectomy for six hours. Um, then it just defeats the purpose. Uh, so he kind of, you know, kind of summarized the whole meeting here uh, with his first sentence. Thanks, Timur, if you're still here. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the cage is typically a small footprint, but that's something that is rapidly changing. Um, and again, the data on segmental lordosis and fusion rates are still pending. Indications, uh, unilateral foraminal stenosis uh, is a perfect indication. Uh, grade one intralysthesis, <coughs> spondylolysis, as long as there's not too much slip. 
So those are great indications. Contraindications, grade two, grade three, uh, it's, it would be just almost impossible to get your way into the foramen there, into the camus triangle. Severe central stenosis, again, possible, but again, I think uh, economically not, not meaningful, at least right now. Uh, and severe deformity, I think those are better treated with uh, open techniques, reduction maneuvers. Um, you've seen very powerful uh, extreme lateral approaches for this, and I think uh, every nail has a different hammer. Um, and uh, <clears throat> anytime you think that you can get a better, better segmental uh, reconstruction with a more appropriate or like a different interbody technique, then, then you should consider that. <laughs> Quickly, uh, surgical perils uh, technique, and we'll go over that in a minute in the lab. Um, <clears throat> you need an endoscope. Uh, here we use a, a TESIS from Joymax. Uh, that's our workhorse. We have other endoscopes too. Uh, I like the reliability of the scope. It's just very durable. Um, if you've never seen something like that, it's just an optical system. So it has a, uh, back there's a lens where you look through. Uh, the lens is right behind the working channel. It has illumination, that's the white thing. Um, the yellow thing, sorry, those are light cable, lights of uh, glass fibers. An irrigation channel, and there's a working channel up here. Um, and you know, if we take one of these endoscopes, you're like, well, it's a piece of like little thing. It's, this endoscope has 180 parts. So it's very, very complex. Um, expandable cages, I think we've seen a lot of cool data today and demos as a, um, presentations today. It definitely reduces the irritation of the exiting nerve root when you introduce it collapsed. In situ expansion it helps with lidosis and you can backfill it with bone graft, as Paul has demonstrated very nicely. Um, it's more expensive and it's <coughs> it can be complicated uh, in terms of deployment. There was also a very nice demonstration on that. Um, different cages, so um, we're going to use the, the Globus Sable cage here, which is uh, <coughs> the advantage of this cage is that it has um, a tremendous amount of low doses from 8 to 22 degrees, um, and uh, the expansion is from 6 to 18 millimeters, so it's a, it's a cage that is very powerful and allows for a nice amount of uh, expansion. We have also used the Rise cage. Other systems is the Optimate mesh case that Dr. Uh, Dr. Wang uses a lot, so that's three-dimensional expandable. Uh, sits right in the middle. Um, it has another name too, which I'm not going to repeat here. Um, then there's Flare Hawk, which is also a three-dimensional cage. It's made like a, it's it's um, it's built like a stent. Um, the nice thing about the Flare Hawk is it's three-dimensional expandable. Uh, and what it really does, the nice thing about Flare Hawk, it it kind of corrects for the surgeons. You know, typically when you go in there, um, people do a, a channel discectomy, so the drill, they have the thing, and the, typically when you look at cadavers after people have done discectomies, the end plate at the trajectory is destroyed. And so what Flair does, it kind of like puts the little, you know, puts his little feet next to your bad work. Uh, and so it kind of, uh, they don't tell you that, but it really is designed just to correct for your insufficient um, discectomy and destruction of end plate, but it, but it's, it works. Um, osteobiologics are really important and should be a uh, part of another meeting. Um, <clears throat> ideally, you get autographed, um, and again, there's MIS retrieval systems uh, from the Iliac Crest, which can give you a decent amount of grafts. Allograft, uh, I think stranded DBM is something that is up and coming, and there's actually a, um, a very nice paper in 2020 by that on stranded DBM, at least in a, in a, in a rat study being much more uh, efficient to create bone than, um, than a cellular allograft, so that's gonna be very interesting to follow that. And then obviously we use a little bit of BMP. I typically use uh, an extra, extra small BMP per level. <coughs> And we have seen this before. Um, Vic, I think you had this um, in your presentation. So it's not the Cambin triangle, it's the Cambin prism. Uh, and uh, you know, we actually um, remove the SAP, so we kind of make it a triangle again. So, sorry. Um, so because the prism is that SAP, and uh, we remove that with the reamers for hematotomy. So uh, we basically just make an artificial Cambin triangle. Here is the steps, and again, we'll see that, so I'll go very fast through, so you wanna, uh, <clears throat> one thing that we changed is, uh, I don't like the 45 degrees, so typically I have the distance on top is two thirds of the distance from the back to the front of the cage, uh, and the reason why I don't do the same distance on both sides, I don't like when the cage is uh, 45 degrees in the weakest area of the bone, I wanna have the tip of the expandable cage sitting on the upper physical ring. 
uh, because that's where they have the strongest bone and the least subsidence. Uh, and I think that's really useful. So I don't like the cages sitting right in the middle of the vertebral body. So that's a distance that we can measure. I'll show you in the lab then afterwards. You get a lateral x-ray, you put something in the field, you measure that, then you measure the <coughs> distance uh, on the back, two thirds of that, and then you get uh, this angle there. And that's your, typically, um, that's your approach trajectory. The next step is going to place a trim sheeting needle. Um, it is nice to have navigation for this step. So uh, in the hospital, we use navigation for this, but it can be easily done with AP fluoro too. So you dock on the SAP, you hammer it through the SAP um, to the, and ideally one of the tip in the medial portion of the Camden's triangle at the posterior spinal level, at this posterior spinal line on the lateral X-ray. So that means that you're, you're safe. And honestly, when you do an MIST lift, that's where you go through your ligament and find the disc. We just get there with a chemistry needle. Foraminotomy is really important. Uh, some people call it foraminoplasty. Uh, we use uh, reamers for that. Um, they are disposable, and the nice thing about them, they are always sharp and always work. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sure uh, in your hospital, when you get your curettes and your keratins, you're always happy how sharp they are. And I'm sure you've asked them to sharpen them for you, and um, I can't repeat that what you hear typically about that when you request that. Um, so it's nice to have sharp instruments, uh, especially for that. So you dock here, you ream, and this is what you see. Well, you're going to see that in a minute here. So you see that here's the pedicle on the right side, SAP, you can use a drill, and then you expose a little bit of your ligament. Down here, the traversing nerve root. Uh, here's the annulus. Um, and you're going to see that you can make sure all the neural structures are both uh, visualized and safe. And then under vision, can you place a KY into the disc? And then you place your working channel. So I go in there, do a discectomy prep. There's different uh, tools. Um, as you can see, there's a whole bunch of uh, new technology here. We have um, these loop corrects. We have true corrects now. And the nicest tool we have right now is that 180 uh, cutter that sort of makes a whole loop and cuts the entire disc out. Um, and we did a lab, and actually the discectomy was not very different from the MIS discectomy from uh, you know, when we, when we looked at this. <clears throat> and so this is one thing that you can do is you can look at the disk space and you see the end plate um, left and right. And we should see that in the lab in just a little bit. Then you place your bone graft. Maybe you can use a fancy gun. <laughs> I never get the fancy thing. But I just they use a funnel. They use it's it. Under water, is that? Yeah. It? Or what? you pull the endoscope at this point. Yeah, you, you pull it out and then just you put the graft in there. You, you're worried that everything floats out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. No, no, it's, that's that's a reasonable thought. Um, you put the graft in again. I like to have the graft right at the apophysial ring. <clears throat> Couple pearls. So in cases where you have central compression, in particular from ventral, um, just had a very a morbidly obese female where we did this, where she had like these bulging discs that caused massive central stenosis. Uh, in these cases, you can actually go more lateral with your incision and they can decompress the entire thecal sac from traversing nerve root to traversing nerve root. In fact, you often get in trouble on the contralateral side because the traversing nerve root moves ventrally into, and so it's easy to actually grab the contralateral nerve root, so you have to be careful there. Uh, so you can do a complete decompression with a little bit more lateral uh, incision, and then use the incision for your screws to put the cage in. Um, you can use uh, bone reamers to accentuate the contralateral facet joint. I like to go in the contralateral facet joint with my MIST lifts to just uh, accentuate that and put some onlay bone graft on. It's um, every now and then, otherwise you have patients that come back that are fused ventrally and not fused dorsally, and, and you wouldn't believe how these patients are bothered by this. I mean, it's just like it's, I've had patients where you're just like, I can't believe I spent eight hours in your back, did a three-level MIST lift, and now the left S1 screw is a little bit loose on the left side, and you were like in agony. And so it's just, that's, you know, so now I typically go into the contralateral side and decorticate that. I'm sure nobody else has that, but that's... Um, and then uh, a modification for L5S1, we like to go medial to the facet joint, uh, so more a plif type, because the transfernal approach at L5S1 is, is very dangerous. The 
L5 um, DOG takes up 60% of the foramen in a healthy specimen. So you can imagine if it's collapsed, you really have no space to go through there. Uh, so that's easy. it's easy to go through the um, medial to the facet joint, ream some of the facet joint, and you have a nice corridor there that is big enough for anything. And then navigation can be very useful. <coughs> The thoracic spine, I know that's a lift day today, but I'll just go to lift today quickly. It's actually, it's, it's not, it's TIFF then, I guess. Um, um, it's actually, uh, the endoscopic uh, interlaminal fusion is surprisingly useful for the thoracic spine. Uh, just make sure you operate on the right level. Um, there actually was recently a paper, I think I reviewed it, it's just like, I mean, we need more of that. It's like the, the rate of wrong level surgery in the thoracic spine is like 2%, um, and it's a never event. Um, it's, but it can happen. So I mean, like, uh, just be very careful that you count the ribs and all this stuff. Thoracic spine, make sure you're at the right level. Um, <clears throat> for aminotomy and decompression, I mean, there's nothing better in the thoracic spine than uh, an endoscopic decompression. We have done ossified discs. We do um, soft discs. Uh, you just make an incision, eight centimeters of midline slide along the ribs, and you see the ventral aspect of the spinal cord. Um, and in the thoracic spine, you can save some money and just put a static cage in there. You just need a little bit to support that structure, and you don't have to deal with anything else. Current data, that's the shortest part of this talk. Uh, there's really not a whole lot of comparisons between endoscopic and MIST lifts. Here's a study uh, from uh, China. They compared, uh, they have a prospective cohort study. Uh, they compared um, 35 endoscopic T lifts with 40 MIST lifts patients. They actually measured CRP and uh, creatinine kinase, uh, which is um, um, you know, a sign of like trauma and tissue irritation, um, interrupted blood loss, and uh, assessed for fusion on CT scan, and followed these patients for 12 months. Uh, <coughs> and um, had rather good results. Um, again, as expected, a slightly longer over time over the post-operative stay was three days versus five days, so it was significantly better than endoscopic, uh, as discussed. Patients needed fewer uh, analgetic uh, medications. All over, you know, did very well. However, you know, really not a lot of data on fusion, not a lot of data on lidosis. So that's, um, you know, missing there. Uh, this is a uh, meta-analysis of all the papers available. They compared 13 articles, um, and six were done with a posterolateral posterol -lateral approach, which I would do at L5 as one, and seven were used with a transfermal Kamen approach, and that's what you're going to see in the lab in just a little bit. Uh, most of these studies had uh, improvement of ODI, as you can see here in the forest plot. Um, again, it's very early in that field, and there's not a lot of comparisons between MIS and endoscopic. Quickly, um, so why are we pursuing this? Um, <clears throat> in my practice, I've, I've switched pretty much all of the non-instrumented spine surgery to full endoscopic. Um, and, and here is really why I do this. I mean, it has cut my service in half. Uh, my inpatient care, if you look for a lumbar discectomy, is 0 0.7 days versus 1.4 days. Lumbar laminectomy, 0 0.7 versus 2.4 days. And lumbar T-lif, if you do it endoscopic, 1.4 days versus 4.8 days. So the more, co more complex the cases, the cases get that you can perform with full endoscopic, the more sort of time you save there. And it's a notable difference. Um, the other thing that is notable is the complication rates. Um, we have a, had a multi-center trial with different centers across the uh, US included 553 cases, uh, all different indications, as you can see here. Uh, and the important stuff was that uh, all over complication rate was 4.7%, um, which was a tremendous uh, difference. And it's noticeable. It's, it's big enough that you notice it in your clinic. Uh, there's, we discussed that for the non-instrumented spine, there's a, a plethora of literature and uh, three randomized controlled trials, uh, class one data for discectomies that they're, they're, they're better. Um, <clears throat> again, for the endoscopic t lift the data is, is, is not that developed yet. Improved or ergonomics, we've talked a lot. We've seen a lot of surgeons today in the cadaver labs, you know, kind of like blowing out the, the necks, um, getting radiculopathy, tennis elbows, and all this stuff. One thing is nice with the endoscopic stuff, it can be very relaxed. Uh, remind me if I don't, I'm not relaxed in the, in the OR afterwards. Um, but theoretically, you should be able to set everything up nicely. Um, there is uh, a definitely a learning curve uh, for each 
different procedure. It takes around 10 to 15 cases to do these type of procedures. Now, it's not a homogenous field. So there's a lot of different procedures we do. We can't compare lumbar disc with a cervical frame anatomy for a thoracic disc and, and a lift. Um, so there's a lot of different procedures. Um, but it's typically, if you're involved, you can go from low complexity and you can slowly uh, learn it. And it's really, um, I would not like to have it out of my practice. It's really uh, fantastic. Um, the capital investment is less than an operative microscope. Um, here we looked at the um, cost effectiveness. Uh, it's a study by Choi et al. 273 patients for lumbar discectomy. And in, in their hands, it was actually um, uh, highly cost effective uh, with endoscopic discectomy, 24,000 per quality, traditional 34,000 per quality. So definitely cost effective. The reason for that is patients go home quicker, there's fewer complications. The outcomes are very similar. Reimbursement, so you can nowadays uh, use uh, this any code uh, uh, with full endoscopic surgery as it is accepted for uh, a mode of visualization. Um, and then here is, you know, the, uh, the proposition for this technique is really the, the fusion surgery uh, as it's going to be more standardized. It can be, um, you know, we can combine it uh, with pain control and recovery and also uh, anesthesia. Um, a wider range of pathologies, um, and in, in fusion surgeries, uh, there's a pathway to really cut cost. Um, and that's the data here as well. Full endoscopic surgery, and that's the last slide here right now, is, is cost neutral for non-instrumented spine. Um, it is highly cost efficient uh, for uh, MIST lifts, and that's from Dr. Wang's data. So uh, in 10 years ago, uh, they, a T lift, an open T lift cost them almost $80,000. In the last paper, their cost was $20,000. So uh, the delta of that is uh, almost $60,000 per case. Uh, and so this was, again, this is not only the endoscopic technique, but being able to save on anesthesia, being able to save on all these other tools, monitoring, just leads to tremendous uh, cost sharing. And the challenge is going to be to do it that you know even normal hospitals and normal individuals can, can, can reproduce this. Which brings me to the conclusions. Um, endoscopic T-lift allows for stabilization of the thoracolumbar spine. There's really cool emerging uh, technology that allows to restore uh, segmental lordosis, and I'm going to. I think you're going to see a cage that is allow this will allow this very nicely. Um, and I think you know it doesn't have to. It's really these cases are now very similar to MIS T-lifts. But we need rigorous studies uh, to determine if we can establish uh, appropriate lordosis and arthrodesis. Uh, and obviously, further improve the workflow, efficient disc removal, and develop larger footprint cages. With that, I want to thank you for listening. And there's one more talk and one more demonstration. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, Christoph. Um, I, you know, I had one question. You know, I, I think. OR efficiency, um, I'm not sure I saw a slide on that, is, um, or I actually did see a, a one slide on that. It's a big thing for most hospitals, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, you know, they, 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 that's kind of one thing that will influence them, the buying equipment, to giving you some resources. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what do you think about the OR efficiency of endoscopic, like TLF versus an open or MIS? I, you know, I think in terms of efficiency, again, the procedure itself, you'll see it, is very, very similar. I think there's not, a whole lot of time saving there, uh, you know, for just doing an MIS T-lift versus endoscopic T-lift. The difference is really if you can do them awake and no, don't need any monitoring, because then it's it really cuts the cost a lot. Uh, and I think the issue is that then you need all the teams aligned. Um, and I think that's going to be for us the next step too, to find, identify an anesthesiologist who is willing to be there for if the duration of a full case, which is very rare these days. Very rare. Um, so I think that's you know the difficulty now is that we're not since surgeons are not in charge anymore of our fate and of our surroundings, um, we cannot you know do the best thing for our patients anymore. Yeah. And so you know I agree. I mean if you do general anesthesia, the advantage is incremental. So um, I guess I have a question. You know I, I find the perk screws are pretty painful. 
I mean, what do you use for anesthesia when you do them uh, for dental t -lift? Well, I mean, again, we do them all, you know, <clears throat> I do them all asleep. Um, but, you know, when we did them with Mike, uh, you just have to infiltrate the track before you get the screw in. So you, the, the trick is to have the, the, the virgin tissue and, and inject a whole lot of local anesthetic into the whole tissue um, and to a block. Um, I mean, I think there's going to be ways to do this more efficiently, um, you know, epidurals, uh, you know, transverse, you know, there's also blocks on the side that you can do where you go into, you know, between the transverse processes, you can infiltrate that. Um, I think there's room for us to get better. Um, I think it's just an emerging field. Uh, and again, in my practice right now, it's like uh, the way where I, this is my workhorse for the thoracic spine and the thoracolumbar junction, right? Because it's like, it's, you don't need low doses and you just, you know, it's, it's nice. It's a super quick way to get an interbody cage in there. And, you know, those cages, uh, those cases are not easy to decompress unless you go extra cavitary, full lateral, right? And I don't, I don't do them anymore. The, the retropleural thoracic discs, um, I have not done one for the next, I, the, these are all endoscopic cases now. Oh, no, I'm looking forward to Osama coming then, watching uh, him do it, actually. I know, he's going to <laughs> clean house there. Yeah.